The bond between couples deeply in love often leads them to share every experience together. Yet tragically, this closeness can sometimes result in shared fatalities from fatal animal encounters. Whether trekking through the wilderness and falling victim to a bear attack, or joyfully swimming in the ocean together only to face a shark attack, a couple's shared adventures may inadvertently expose them to life-threatening situations. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. In today's episode, we go over three times couples were tragically attacked and killed together by wild animals. Welcome to Final Affliction. The grizzly bear is a fierce predator and should be avoided at all costs. They have been responsible for over 180 deaths in recent years, although the majority of the time bear attacks are very rare. They will usually only attack when they are protecting food, their cubs, or territory, and would rather avoid humans altogether. However, there are some people who intentionally seek them out and enter their territory like Timothy Treadwell, a.k.a. the Grizzly Man. Even at a young age, Timothy had always been particularly fond of animals, and even had a pet squirrel when he was a child. In his adolescence, he had his first encounter with a wild bear while studying them in Alaska, and that's when he realized his true life calling. He stated that he had lost his way at college, and he had fallen into alcoholism and drug use, nearly overdosing on heroin in the late 80s. This close call with death is what motivated him to initially search out bears and make them his lifelong passion. He studied the bears for 13 years and wrote a book from his findings called Among Grizzlies, Living with Wild Bears in Alaska. During this time, the bears became used to his presence and he was able to touch them and play with their cubs. In his own words, he stated that he had a good relationship with bears based on mutual trust and respect. Following the release of his book, Timothy began to gain some recognition for his work in television and environmental circles. He traveled around the U.S. to educate local schools and appeared on many TV shows to explain his unique experiences with the animals. He even created his own charity with co-worker Jewel Polovec called Grizzly People with a plan to continue protecting the grizzly bears in their habitat. Timothy was met with controversy throughout his life, mainly due to his interference with the animals. The National Park Service, in particular, were very unhappy and worried with his actions, as they believed that he was disrupting the animal's natural behavior, as well as putting himself at enormous risk. Timothy was also leading unauthorized tours with visitors to take them closer to the animals, something that was never allowed by the parks. He was thought to be reckless as he refused to install any electric fences around his camps or carry bear spray, stating that bears would never hurt him due to their relationship together. Despite their fears, Timothy did not bring any further protection from the bears and he would soon find out that his relationship with these bears could easily be broken. In October 2003, Timothy and his girlfriend, Amy Hugunard, visited Katmai National Park in Alaska. They were warned of the dangers of camping in the area at this time of year, as food was scarce and the bears were preparing for winter, eating anything they could to store for hibernation in the coming months. The aim of the trip was to see one of Timothy's favorite female brown bears and wanted to check that she was okay and ready for the winter. Amy was very reluctant to do this as she was particularly scared of bears and just wanted to go home, but she stayed as she knew how important the bears were to her boyfriend. Throughout the trip, the pair tracked a few of the bears, but Timothy quickly realized that the majority of the bears that were familiar with him had gone into hibernation already, and there were a number of unfamiliar bears. Although he was slightly uncomfortable with the thought of being surrounded by bears that didn't know him, he still decided to stay and set up camp with Amy. On October 5th, the pair were setting up their video camera to get some more footage of the bears. The setup was nearly complete. 
The camera was on and recording audio, but the lens cap was still in place, providing no visuals as of yet. Soft rain sounds can be heard as Amy prepares the equipment from inside the tent. Suddenly, Amy calls out to Timothy asking him if he's still out there as she can't hear him. Then, the screaming begins. Timothy was screaming to Annie to get out of the tent and to escape as he was torn apart by the large 28-year-old male bear. Amy opens the tent and begins screaming at Timothy to play dead to get the bear to leave him alone, which seemed to have worked for a time as the pair can be heard discussing whether the bear was truly gone yet. In this time, Amy is thought to have approached Timothy to tend to his wounds, which were unknown at this point, but she had to retreat as the bear returned to attack Timothy once again. This is when Timothy begins to panic, as he realizes playing dead is no longer going to work. He begs Amy to hit the bear with something, and she grabs a frying pan to smack the bear in the head. The bear lets go of Timothy's head and instead bites into his thigh to drag him away from Amy. Covered in blood and knowing he has no chance of survival past this point, Timothy begins shouting to Amy telling her to run away and save herself. Although he struggled, he knew enough about bears to know he was done for. Unlike other victims of bear attacks, he didn't go into shock during the attack and was fully aware the entire time he was eaten alive by the animal that he loved so much. The bear was silent, aside from sporadic growls and grunts. The only real sound that could be heard during this ordeal is the sound of Timothy desperately trying to escape. His screams of agony and the dull sound of his body being dragged across the dirt away from his camp. Unfortunately, Amy still didn't leave. She was frozen with fear and in shock from the horrifying scene. She was already terrified of bears and had just witnessed her worst nightmare. She wasn't familiar with the area, being brought to the park by Timothy, and had no idea how to get back to civilization. On the tape, you can hear her suddenly begin to scream. It was a scream similar to that of a wounded animal, as she realized what she had just witnessed, as well as her situation. Unfortunately, her screams only brought the bear right back to her to finish the job and Amy was also mauled to death by the same bear. The next morning, air taxi pilot Willie Fulton arrived at Kaflia Lake to transport the pair out of the area. He looked around and thought he could see Timothy shaking a tarp to get his attention, but when Willie called out, there was no response. He decided to hike up the path, but quickly turned around as he felt like something wasn't right. Once he reached his plane, he turned around and saw something that made his blood turn cold. Through the fog, a large, nasty-looking brown bear was staring at him, just aside from the path that he had just followed. He quickly climbed back into his plane and set off, hoping to scare the bear off with the engine so that Timothy and Amy would be able to pass through without meeting the bear. He kept his eyes on the bear and could see him slowly eating something. Willie circled the campsite 15 to 20 times, each time, trying to get a better look at the bear and what it was eating. That's when he realized that the bear was eating a human rib cage. Horrified, he called the park rangers and asked them to come and survey the area, as he believed something had happened to the pair. A group of rangers arrived and began to trek up to the campsite, with Willie guiding them. They spotted a couple of bears on their way up, but as the bears ignored them, they continued without an issue. Suddenly, one of the rangers shouted, Bear, alerting the others to the animal about 20 feet away. They began shouting at the bear in an attempt to scare it off, but it soon became clear that it knew they were there, was not threatened, and was actively stalking them. They all began shooting at the bear, firing a total of 21 shots between the three rangers. They didn't stop shooting until the bear was shot dead. They continued to the campsite where they found Timothy and Amy's two tents collapsed and torn with a large mud pile at the front of the entrance. The rangers moved some of the mud aside and found Amy's body with her fingers pushing through the dirt. She had been buried by the bear, ready for winter. When they moved the rest of the mud aside, she looked as though she was peacefully sleeping, 
except for the clear fact that she had been almost entirely eaten by the bear. They were horrified but determined to find Timothy, although the hopes of him being alive were fading fast. They combed the nearby area and found bits of him scattered all around the forest. His head was found attached to a piece of his spine with a horrific grimace on his face, capturing the pain in which he died. His right arm and hand were also found lying nearby, his watch still attached. It was a gruesome scene to find. As the rangers were discovering the bodies, another smaller bear attempted to approach them. He was approximately three years old and was stalking the team from 30 feet away, making it clear that he would continue to approach and attempt to attack them. He was swiftly shot by the rangers, who didn't want to take any chances given the situation they were in. Once Timothy and Amy's bodies had been extracted from the park, the rangers sent the corpses of the large bear to be investigated. A necropsy was conducted and it was found that the bear had human remains and clothing within its stomach, concluding that this was the bear that had killed and eaten the couple. The younger bear had already been cannibalized by other bears, so we will never know if it had anything to do with Timothy and Amy's deaths. Ultimately, it's important to remember to respect wild animals and give them the space that they deserve. Even if bonds are formed with the animals, you never know what might happen or what else might be lingering in the forest, waiting for the chance to bring you to your horrifying final affliction. Boyfriend and girlfriend Roy Stoddard and Tamara McAllister were two 24-year-olds who met whilst teaching in the same school in West Malibu, California. They initially bonded over their sense for adventure. Tamara was preparing for public health work in Kenya as part of her master's degree. Roy turned his hand to anything from mountain climbing, biking and surfing to scuba diving and kayaking. The two of them spent all their spare time hiking, camping and kayaking together. On Thursday, January 26, 1989, the couple were training for a triathlon that they were planning on competing in together. In preparation for the upcoming race, they kayaked and swam daily. Their usual route took them on a three-mile round trip from Latigo Point to Paradise Cove. They each took a single-man kayak into the water on that fateful day. They headed down to the water just before 9 a.m. Pausing on the sand, they both sat down and enjoyed a hot cup of coffee and a muffin to kickstart their day. A passerby saw them launch at 9.30 before they paddled northwards around Latigo Point and on towards Paradise Cove. It was like any of their other training days. The couple were happy and excited to spend the time together. The wind was light and the seas were fairly calm. As they paddled into the sea that day, they were never to return again. There were no further sightings of the couple alive. Tamara's body was found two days later. This story is based on the findings and subsequent report by the case investigator Ralph Collier. The following is one of the number of possibilities that could have happened to the couple and is based on circumstantial evidence. After finishing their coffee, they put on their windbreakers and zipped them up over their swimsuits. These were blue and black wetsuit style jackets that kept them warm on the open water. As the wind was picking up, there was a chill in the air. The couple paddled to about 100 yards out, remaining shoreside of the kelp beds. They knew it was safer not to paddle beyond the kelp forests, as more often than not, they act as a natural deterrent to sharks. After heading around Latigo Point, the wind buffeted them. It whipped the surface of the sea, the salt spray wetting their faces and stinging their eyes. They bowed their heads against it, digging in and persevering. The training route usually took them 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how long they stopped for a swim at the halfway point. Today, it was taking them a bit longer. They lashed their kayaks together as Tamara was being blown off course. The momentary pause in paddling gave them a breather and some respite. They decided to continue. Roy made headway in the lead kayak, cutting a wake for Tamara to follow. He felt the tugging of the rope every so often as it went taut, pulling Tamara back on course. It wasn't long before they could see their halfway destination, Paradise Cove. But they never made it. Suddenly, without warning, there was a tremendous smash from below the water. 
Something from the depths torpedoed upwards and struck the boats from underneath. The two of them were thrown from their kayaks and slammed into the sea. Tamara resurfaced coughing and sputtering, unsure of what had just happened. Seconds later, she felt a tremendous tug on her left thigh and was pulled underwater. Kicking and thrashing around, she desperately tried to pull herself to the surface, but a shark had a strong grip of her leg. She could feel her lungs about to burst as the shark twisted and turned underwater. Roy had knocked his head on his kayak when he had been thrown into the ocean. Dazed and dizzy, he frantically blinked trying to make sense of the situation. Seconds later, he heard the terrified screams of his girlfriend as she momentarily resurfaced. He wheeled around to see a sea of red and their upturned kayaks bobbing in the water. He immediately swam over to the commotion and managed to grab Tamara's hand. Pulling her above the surface of the water, she gasped for breath. He held on to her trying desperately to pull her to the boats. The hulls of the kayaks were wet and slippery. Each time he tried to grab on, his hand would slip. He lifted one side trying to flip it back over, but the weight was immense and whilst holding on to Tamara with one arm, he didn't have the strength to right the boat. He tried again and again. The commotion in the water was witnessed by Margaret Bloom. As she looked out of her living room windows at 10.15 that morning, she noticed an incredible boiling of the water and thrashing about. It was out past the kelp beds near a large United States Coast Guard buoy. She spotted a number of seals leap out of the water onto the surface of the buoy, avoiding the churning sea. They were anxious and agitated. It is unclear whether this commotion was a shark attacking one of the seals or whether it was the actual attack on Tamara and Roy. If it was the former and had unsuccessfully caught a seal, the same shark may have turned its attention to the kayaks a few moments later. As Roy held on to Tamara, keeping her afloat, he could feel her slipping away. The shark had severed her femoral artery and she was bleeding out, but the shark hadn't finished yet. It returned and in a frantic attack, it took hold of Roy and dragged him underwater, never to be seen again. When the couple didn't show up to work the next day, their friends and colleagues raised the alarm. People knew that Tamara and Roy had taken the kayaks out and they knew their routine paddle. The kayaks were found the day after the attack. They were floating and upturned less than 20 miles from where the couple had paddled, on the opposite side of Santa Monica Bay. The kayaks had stress fractures along their holes and one had a hole in the bow. On examination of this evidence, an engineer suggested that significant impact and force would cause this kind of damage. The object that struck the kayaks needed to have been in excess of 2,000 pounds or 900 kilograms and traveling at least 17 knots. These are characteristics of a great white shark. These incredible apex predators are also known to attack their prey from behind or from underneath, often shooting out of the water as they do so. The following day, the crew of a sailing boat found Tamara's body floating in the water. The current had carried her 30 miles north of Paradise Cove, near Channel Islands Harbor. She was still wearing her jacket, which suggests that she wasn't swimming when she was attacked. Her injuries included deep bite wounds to her upper thighs. One had severed her femoral artery and vein, and the other measured more than 34 centimeters or 13 inches in diameter. She had bruising to her hand and head, possibly from being thrown from her kayak. From the size of the bite marks and severity of the injuries, it was concluded that a great white shark measuring at least five feet long had been the cause of the fatality. Following the discovery of Tamara's body, the United States Coast Guard conducted a search and rescue operation by both boat and helicopter to try and find Roy. After a week-long search, no trace of him was ever found. This devastating attack happened within sight of the shore and yet no one witnessed it. The young couple were both fit and adventurous. Although Tamara was new to kayaking, Roy had been on the water since childhood and both were exceptional swimmers. Their lives were cut tragically short, simply doing what they loved. While the ocean and its beaches provide us with some of nature's greatest playgrounds, we must remember that this is the shark's habitat, not ours. And despite how experienced and prepared you might be, one encounter with these murderous creatures can lead you to your unfortunate final affliction. 
This story just goes to show that animal attacks can happen to even the most experienced and cautious hikers and campers. The tragedy occurred in September 2023 and shook the residents of the province of Alberta. Doug Inglis, aged 62, and Jenny Goussy, also 62, had been together since university. They lived in Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada. They were inseparable, both working as technicians in the same scientific lab. They had a deep love for the great outdoors and were certainly no stranger to the challenges that it can sometimes present. They each carried with them vital survival kits and emergency equipment every time they ventured into the wilderness. They traveled out to Banff National Park twice a year, usually once in the spring and once in the fall. But the National Park is home to some of the deadliest predators in Canada, grizzly bears. There are thought to be 65 individuals that call Banff home, with a further 20 to 40 black bears too. A family member said that Doug and Jenny were very careful people when they were on their adventures in the wilderness, whether it be hiking, camping, canoeing, or whitewater rafting. They knew bear protocol, and they followed it to a T. But sometimes, with even the best precautions in place, people can find themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time. The pair had with them their sidekick and hiking companion, their dog. The three of them stuck to signposted routes and always adhered to any warnings displayed throughout the park. But on that fateful trip in late September 2023, there were no warnings. No bears had been sighted in that area, and there had been no reports of them from visitors. They were on day five of a week-long visit to the park, something they looked forward to every year. They were making their way along Red Deer River Valley, west of Yahatinda Ranch. This valley is an untouched landscape within the park. It is inaccessible to most hikers, with no roads leading in or out of it. Meadows give way to mature spruce forests, and towering above the valley floor are craggy mountaintops and glacial cirques. The area is home to some fascinating wildlife, including elk, moose, wolves, grizzly bears, and cougars. The landscape is simply stunning, but its remoteness isn't for the faint of heart, and it has its dangers. After the fifth day's hiking, the couple found a spot to camp for the night. They hadn't made it to the planned camping spot, but wanted to set up before it got dark. They knew bears posed a real threat and didn't want to run into one as the sun set. It was a sensible decision. They had time to set up their tent and cook dinner before night fell. As the three of them settled around the campfire, Doug sent a notification message using their Garmin in reach to his uncle, Colin Inglis. The message said they hadn't made the planned campsite, but were setting up camp now. The message pinged through at 5 p.m. It was the reassurance their family needed, and it was yet another safety precaution the cautious couple took whilst hiking in the backcountry. They checked in with family twice every day, but what the couple didn't know was that there was a grizzly bear on the prowl that evening. As the weather begins to get colder, bears enter a hyperphagic state in which they gorge themselves on as much food as possible before the winter. It's essential for them to pack in the calories and pack on the pounds. They need to make it through the long, cold, dark winter months all the way through to springtime. Something alerted the bear to their presence. Perhaps it was their scent, the smell of their dinner, or the clinking of pots and pans as they cleared away their dinner. Whatever happened, their bear came for them. The couple, being experienced campers and bear-wise, had hung up their food in a nearby tree so as not to attract bears into their tent. They also kept with them a can of bear spray each. After dinner, Doug and Jenny crawled into their tent with their dog. As night fell and darkness engulfed Banff National Park, the two of them sat up reading on their e-readers, something they did every night before settling down. But outside, a grizzly bear was approaching the tent. They could hear it sniffing just the other side of the canvas. They stayed still and as quiet as possible, hardly daring to breathe. Then terrifyingly, it slashed through the canvas and tried to grab the couple inside. The dog growled and barked, and Doug and Jenny tried to scare it away, yelling at it. Doug reached for his bear spray and emptied the canister at the bear. 
but in a fury, the bear fought back. Nobody knows exactly what happened during those horrifying moments, but one of them sent an SOS message from the Garmin, which Doug's uncle received. It said, bear attack, bad. So last Monday, they started out. And Monday night, like every other time, I would, at the end of the day, I would get an in-reach message saying, we're at our destination, everything's okay. Um, on Friday night, same thing. Uh, at uh, 4.52, I got a message saying, we're delayed, but everything's okay. And uh, that message would mean that they were in a camp, their camp was set up, they were probably making dinner, and they were messaging myself and Jenny's mom with that message to say that they, things were good. Um, 8.15, the phone rings. I got a phone call from Garmin, uh, who InReach belongs to, and the message was, we've had an SOS message, and the SOS, not only was the SOS activated, which was a, is a button, but there was a message input into the inReach that said, bear attack bad. So at that point, we, we knew something was happening that was very bad, that they were in trouble. The distress message also immediately alerted a wildlife human attack response team. This emergency GPS device was yet another piece of equipment the well-prepared couple always carried with them. It was potentially a life-saving device. The response team were deployed immediately. The use of a chopper was out of the question due to poor weather and poor visibility. This was a serious blow. The rescue team knew that after a bear attack, every second counts, and now they were forced to make the journey on foot. They were specially trained individuals with mountaineering and medical training, specifically to attend to animal attack victims. Marching through the Canadian wilderness, they didn't know what they were going to find at the location. Nobody knew if the victims were dead or alive. They had to traverse the steep rocky terrain in the dead of night, their flashlights illuminating the way. They knew they were walking into danger. They knew that a bear was out there, and yet, they had to keep going to try and reach the couple in desperate need. At one o'clock in the morning, five hours after they received the distress signal, the rescuers arrived at the couple's camp. The scene they arrived at was distressing. They could see signs of a struggle and, tragically, they could see three dead bodies, those of Doug and Jenny and that of their dog. The grizzly bear had rampaged through the camp, destroying everyone in it. The three of them lay on the ground outside the tent. As they scouted around the campsite, they tried to piece together what had happened. The food was still hung up in the trees, and lying on the ground were two cans of bear spray. They were empty. The tent was flattened and shredded. The two e-readers were inside with their screens smashed. There were signs of a struggle that didn't occur in just one place. There was evidence that the couple tried to scare the bear away, but none of their preparation and none of their scare tactics worked. But the rescue team wasn't alone. They were being watched by the same grizzly. It stood just yards away, hidden by the trees. As they investigated the scene, they suddenly heard a crashing through the undergrowth. Turning their heads and spinning their flashlights around, they saw a grizzly bear emerging from the trees illuminated by their flashlight beams. It ran into the clearing. It wasn't going to stop. This wasn't a mock charge. They only had one option. Pulling the trigger on a rifle, one of the rescue teams shot the bear. It fell to the ground just feet from where they stood. Royal Canadian Mounted Police arrived at the scene at 5 o'clock that morning. They carefully carried the victims away and sent the bear off for a necropsy. The investigation into the bear revealed that she was a 25-year-old female. She wasn't lactating at the time, and wasn't tagged or known to the park rangers as a nuisance bear. She was in fairly good condition but with poor teeth and less than normal body fat for that time of year. Her behavior had been very aggressive. If a bear has attacked a person due to defense from being startled, then it usually leaves the area afterwards. But this bear remained nearby. Could this bear have been hunting the two hikers? Was this a predatory attack? Attacks by bears in Canada are rare, 
and predatory attacks exceedingly rare, with just 65 grizzlies in the park. The last known fatal attack occurred in 1973, when a heavily sedated bear charged at a biologist as it was being relocated and released. Of course, this tragedy has hit Doug and Jenny's family and friends hard. It is difficult to comprehend exactly what has happened and the sequence of events that led up to their deaths. Those who knew the couple are in a state of shock, and for it to have happened to such an experienced couple means that it can happen to anyone. Even after deploying two cans of bear spray onto the bear, it wasn't enough to stop the couple's terrifying final affliction.